Okay, so fast forward. Um, back to Jacob. Jacob goes away and God reveals himself to him and pretty much tells him he's going to continue Abraham's promise through him. So we've gone from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob now. So, and um, I think it's pretty clear that God was going to do it through Jacob all along. But um, I think if anything, this story should show us how when you try to put your hands in the mix and you try to make what God promised you happen your own way, it, it's never going to work out. And it's just going to lead to a lot of destruction and sorrow. And you have to be spirit led. So although Jacob was going to be used because um, God actually told um, Rebecca that way before they were even born, that Esau was going to serve the younger brother. So that had already been prophesied, you know, and I'm sure that, um, Rebecca and Jacob being close, that being her favorite son, I'm, I'm sure she probably shared that information with him that God had prophesied to her while uh, she was pregnant with the two of them that Jacob would be the one. But at the same time, you see how Rebecca, she took what God promised her and she tried to make it happen her own way. Instead of letting God do it, you know, himself, she put her hands in the mix and, um, she wasn't operating in the Holy Spirit and she wasn't being led by the Holy Spirit. She was operating in the wrong spirit. I say the Jezebel spirit, honestly. And she took matters into her own hands and uh, she was being, being very manipulative. And as a result, um, just a whole bunch of strife and chaos and confusion was the result of that. So let that be a word of wisdom for y'all out there and just for all of us. If God has promised you something... Or um, he's prophesied something to you or he's shown you something that's going to come to pass. Please just surrender, which we, we learned that that means to relinquish your control over that particular thing. Just rest and be patient and wait on the Lord to fulfill what he promised you. If he needs you to do something, I promise you he will let you know. Okay, it's, it's not hard for the Lord to just speak something into your spirit or give you an unction or... A dream or a vision somehow to let you know if he needs your help but um until he does that he does not need your help and the only thing you're going to do is mess something up you know <laughs> it's like god is baking cookies and we keep opening the oven like is it done yet is it done yet oh my god cook faster like you know and you just turn the oven up some more and you end up burning the cookies that god was baking for you and it's just like why don't you just leave it alone and let me do it you know i know how to make the cookies come out right you don't know how to bake cookies brandy like just just stop putting your hand and stuff just leave it alone let me do it and uh and it, it just goes to show you know because a, a lot of people a lot of people in the body of christ we have god like tell us something or he has plans to give us something and when the harvest kind of like comes out really twisted looking or messed up or just doesn't happen at all people look at god and they call god a liar and uh, they start looking at you funny. And they're, you know, look, they're looking at the cookies like, well, what the heck happened? I thought you said God baked these cookies. <laughs> you know what's going on with that. And uh, the truth is that person did something wrong. It, the God is not a liar. God didn't do anything wrong. That person probably put their hands in the mix. They messed it up somehow, whether it was through fear and unbelief or um, tampering and operating in the wrong spirit. Because once again, the Lord taught me that when it comes to receiving anything he promised you, you have to walk into it by faith. And walking into God's promises is coming into alignment with his counsel and what he set out to uh, what he set out to do. And the only way you can walk into God's promises, which are spiritual, is to walk in the Holy Spirit. So clearly Rebecca was not walking in the Holy Spirit. She was not being led by the Father to do what she did. She took something God told her and knew that it was supposed to come to pass. And instead of trusting God, like Abraham did, instead of trusting God to do exactly what he said he was going to do, she took it upon herself to deceive her husband. And so she could see to it and make sure for sure that what God said is going to happen. Jacob is going to be the one blessed, you know, and you know what's so crazy about this? <laughs> it just goes to show the lack of trust that Rebecca had in God and that many of us have in God because even if 
even if Isaac was going to bless Esau first, you didn't even know what he was going to say. So the fact that she just took it upon herself to like eavesdrop like that and hurry up and rush Jacob in there. She went through all that trouble with putting on um, Esau's, you know, garments upon Jacob and cooking all that food, you know, trying to hurry up and get Jacob in there before Esau, thinking that, you know, um, God wasn't going to be able to fulfill what he promised her. And the whole time, I mean, while she's leaning onto her logic, she didn't even know what Isaac was going to tell Esau. Like, how would you know that God wasn't going to use or wasn't going to put in um, Isaac's heart to still bless Jacob greater? Second, I mean, she, she didn't even know that. And she just still took it upon herself to just do it her way. And she screwed everything up. So once again, <laughs> I feel like the Lord, you know, I just love the Old Testament so much. because I just like the story part of the Old Testament. When you read it, you just learn so much. And God has given us the Bible to just really teach us, like, this is what happens when y'all do this. Look at this story. This, this is real life stories that happen because they did this. They did not wait on me. They didn't trust me. When I told them I was going to do something for them, they took it upon themselves. And this is what happens. I don't want y'all to do this because it's going to turn out like this. So, um... The Bible even says that, like, the Old Testament is, uh, the people in the Old Testament are, are an example for the New Testament saints. So, read these stories and take it to heart. Like, make sure it gets deeply rooted all up in there. You do not want to end up like these people. Okay. I used to think that, like, I used to think when, before I became a Christian, that everybody in the Bible were just, like, holy people, you know? And when I started reading, I was like, oh, my God, like, these people are jacked up. I thought everybody in the Bible was, like, on point, <laughs> you know? And now I clearly see that, no, they were regular people just like us. Um, they were God's chosen people, that's true. But as you can see, they were highly flawed. Uh, Rebecca was doing some ratchet stuff. We're going to talk about Leah and Rachel in um, a couple minutes. Uh, Jacob was a hot mess, deceiving. I mean... They were just normal, everyday people, and um, just like me, you are normal, everyday people, but um, we can take what they did as a lesson learned or as an example of what not to do. And um, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, so don't think that just because these people are old and they're in the Bible that it's not going to happen the same way for you. It is going to happen the same way for you, because there are spiritual laws in place, and when you go against the Father in rebellion... Or you try to rush ahead of God with something like that. He don't take it lightly to stuff like that. And you will have to reap what you sow. So if you want a good harvest, then you just need to you need to be in alignment with, God, with God's will. How he wants to do it. And when he wants to do it. If it's five years from now, well honey, you just need to be team God. Okay? Because I promise you, his way is way better than you try to rush them pancakes and them cookies in the oven. Because they're going to come out all nasty and you're going to be pissed off. Well, God, I said you was, I thought you said you was going to bless me, Lord. Why did it happen like that? Because you put your hands in it. I didn't tell you to help me cook. I don't need your help cooking nothing. <laughs> like, I know the Lord just looks upon us like my poor kids. Like, y'all just don't get it. You know, like, I don't, the, the love for his children never goes away. But it really is. I'm sure we are like a pain in the butt for God. Like, why can't you just trust me and just chill out? The only reason I told you what I was going to do is so that you could have a spirit of expectancy, okay? I didn't I didn't tell you so you could go do all this extra stuff and go blab it and go, you know. But, of course, you know, um, the Lord is going to whoop you if you do that. But he'd rather not whoop you. He'd rather just teach you how to just trust him and have faith. And um, the consequences will help you so next time you know not to do it again. But anyway, so... um. So Jacob is at his uncle's house, like his mama told him to go. And here is where Rachel comes on the scene, which is why, if y'all are wondering why I changed my YouTube name, this is why. I always change my YouTube name. I didn't even know that Google had a, a name change limit. They tell you after the fact. So my name is going to be Rachel Yeshua's Beloved for like ever until Christ comes back. Or unless they change the rules. <laughs> I was like, that is such crap. Like, why would they tell you after the fact that there's a limit? But anyway, I changed my name to Rachel because um, God had just told me something personally that he spoke in my spirit. Uh, Rachel is a type and figure for the for the bride of Christ. But she was also um, Jacob's favorite wife. So 
I changed my name <laughs> to that for uh, a personal reason. But, yeah. So, yeah, um, Jacob is on the scene and he's looking for his uncle. And he sees some guys, you know, um, watering or feeding the flocks, it says. He's asking, um, it says, and Jacob said unto them, my brethren, whence be ye? And they said of Haran, or Haran, whatever are we. And he said unto them, Know ye Laban, the son of Nahor? And they said, We know him. And he said unto them, Is he well? And they said, He is well. And behold, Rachel, his daughter, comes with the sheep. And he said, Lo, it is yet high day, neither is it time that the cattle should be gathered together. Water ye the sheep, and go and feed them. And they're like, Oh, we can't do that right now, blah, blah, blah. And while he yet spake with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she kept them. And it came to pass, when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. And Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted up his voice. <laughs> so, um, I've noticed that there's a special, uh, little history line that has been going on with Abraham's kids. Like even how, um, Isaac found Rebecca, it was, it's the same way that, uh, his, his son here is, is finding Rachel when Isaac, um, or when Rachel was, uh, delivered, not Rachel, Rebecca, get it. Okay. Rachel, Rebecca, Rachel, Rebecca, when Rebecca was revealed to Isaac and when she was delivered to him, the servant had found, uh, Rebecca, uh, feeding the flock, remember? And she was the God ordained wife for Isaac. So his son here, it's like history is repeating itself. And just like his dad fell in love with Rebecca, he sees Rachel and he falls in love <laughs> all over again. And I think it's funny because I think it says that, um, lo, it is yet high day, and neither is it time that the cattle should be gathered together. Water, water the sheep and go and feed them. And they said, we cannot until all the flocks be gathered together until they roll the stone from the well's mouth. Then we water the sheep. <clears throat> yeah, so basically the guys are telling him, well, <laughs> we can't feed the, uh, the cattle right now, water them until all the flock is gathered together. So he immediately sees Rachel and just gets like love smitten. And I can just totally imagine this on a movie. Like she's just walking in slow motion and there's that music in the background. <laughs> <laughs> like wow thing uh, uh, uh. <laughs> you know? so they just told him dude you can't feed the cattle but he just sees her and he's just glued and he just goes over there and he just does it <laughs> she does it anyway <laughs> that is cute and um he kisses her out of nowhere and uh it says he lifted up his voice and he wept if a guy was to do that to me i probably think something was wrong with him <laughs> Like, boy, if you would get your behind away from me, that is just so awkward. But anyway, and Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's brother and that he was Rebecca's son, and she ran and told her father. So she probably didn't know what the heck he was, what he was up to. <coughs> All right. And when it came to pass, when Laban heard the tidings of Jacob, his sister's son, that he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his house. So mind you, this is the same brother that was a witness to um to the word of marriage that Rebecca and Isaac had. So he was there to hear the servant pretty much say how God led him there. Y'all remember that? And he was excited and he was like, whoa, blah, blah, blah. So this is the same guy. So when he sees that his sister has a son, of course he's embracing the guy, you know, just has like a special love for his nephew and stuff. So Laban welcomes Jacob into his home. He's like, so since you're going to be staying here, like, you know, let me, let me pay you something. I don't want you just staying here, you know, for nothing. And Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah was tender eyed, but Rachel was beautiful and well favored. And Jacob loved Rachel and said, I will serve thee seven years for Rachel, thy younger daughter. And Laban said, it is better that I give her to you than that I should give her to another man. Abide with me. It says, and Jacob served seven years for Rachel. And I cannot, hold on. 
had to hide my husband's name. Um, and Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed unto him but a few days for the love he had for her. That is so beautiful. <laughs> oh, God. I'm sorry. I'm such a step. But no, it's just so relatable. Like, he worked seven years for her, and it wasn't even that long to him because he loved her so much. But, um, <laughs> y'all didn't see that, did you? I hope not. Yes, the struggle. But anyway, so um, you see how it said that uh, Leah was tender-eyed, but Rachel was beautiful and well-favored. And um, David Eels, one of his books um, where he, I think it's called The Spiritual Israel. It's a beautiful, beautiful book. I mean, there's just so many types of figures and so much revelation in his book when he's teaching about how um, the Christians are the true Israelites. And it's just so beautiful. But he does say that Leah was a type, not just a type of um, the Old Testament Hebrews and how Rachel was the one that Jesus was going to come for from the beginning. She's spiritual Israel. That's what she that's what she represents. But Leah being tender eyed also represents how physical Israel had no discernment, just like um, you just saw Isaac did when he was when he was on his deathbed. Um, Leah being tender eyed, she didn't have eyes to see, basically. <laughs> Is what that means. And I can send y'all that ebook. Just post your email below. So this is where you start to see Jacob is finally beginning to reap his harvest for all of the deception that he caused a few years ago. So he's done working the seven years for Rachel for his uncle. And Jacob said unto Laban, give me my wife for my days are fulfilled that I may go in unto her. And Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. And it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to him. And he went in unto her. Sorry, I got a sticky note on here. And it says that, um, and Laban gave unto his daughter Leah, Zilpah, his maid for an handmaid. And it came to pass that in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, what is this you have done unto me? Did not I serve thee for Rachel? Wherefore then have you beguiled me? And Laban said, It must not be so done to our country to give the younger before the firstborn. <laughs> oh, I read that and I laughed so hard. I said, that's exactly what you get. So you see, this is why I love this story so much. Because like I said, you can just see God's hand behind it. And it just goes to show the sovereignty of God. Because people think they can run away from the Lord. You can run away from your circumstances. You can run away from your situations, but you cannot run away from the hand of God. And you surely cannot run away from your harvest. You will reap exactly what you sow. That's just the spiritual law that's never going to disappear, period. So the irony of um, Jacob and his mama starting all this mess a few years ago, getting that boy to deceive his daddy so he could steal his brother's birthright and his blessing. So she hurries up once again. She's being manipulative again. She tells him, run away to my uh, to my brother's house. Go to your uncle's house so um, so Esau won't kill you. So she, in her mind and in Jacob's mind, of course, they're thinking, well, if they run away, if, if Jacob runs away, you're running away from the hand of God as well. When in, in actuality, you still reap your harvest either way. You can't run away from God. So I love how God like... <laughs> It's just so funny. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's what your behind get. So he's worked seven years for Rachel. And I guess at that time, you know, whenever they got married or whenever they would finally have sex with the woman, she was still veiled. So he really didn't even know who he was sleeping with. So what does that sound like to you? That's exactly how his dad felt when he came and deceived his dad and his dad couldn't tell him apart from his brother. So now you know what it feels like, Jacob, to be deceived. You thought it was Rachel, just like your daddy thought it was you or thought it was Esau when really it was Leah. <laughs> so I wrote that down. I need to write that down. I need to write that down. So God is just like owning him right now. It's just so horrible. It gets worse. But so that's like the first recompense you see is that he was deceived the same way he deceived his daddy. He's reaping exactly what he sold all those years ago. He thought it was Rachel that came in to bed with him. Didn't know the difference, just like his daddy didn't. And uh, it's not a good feeling. And um. God just kind of puts it right in his face. I love it how the Lord um, gives somebody a recompense for their harvest that way. Because if you've done somebody wrong and you're starting to reap your harvest for that, 
it's so funny how God lets you know why you're suffering. I think that is the most, I mean, I've experienced it for myself. It's like he will put it in your conscience. You're suffering this because you did this all them years ago. Or you hurt this person this bad. So now this is happening to you. So God's going to let you know. Just like how you used to catch a whooping. And you know how your mama, your daddy, when they whooping you, they telling you why. <laughs> They're like beating you. So I think it's so funny. He gets deceived. And he has the nerve to ask his uncle, what is this that you've done to me? You've beguiled me. Oh, but you forgot how you beguiled your daddy all them years ago. <laughs> you said out of your own mouth that you was deceiving him. And his uncle tells him, this ain't nobody but God, by the way. His uncle tells him it must not be so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. <laughs> so it's like a slap in the face. Like you dishonored your brother and you stole his blessing. When in reality, Esau was supposed to get that first blessing. So even though God was going to use you the whole time, Jacob, the way you went about doing it, it was very shysty. It was very shady. So if you didn't want to honor that law back then, you can honor it now. So guess what? You get Leah first and not Rachel. Sucks for you. And he thought he was going to get away with it too. That's what his behind get. Funny. And his uncle is something else as well. <laughs> his uncle don't even know what played out. Don't even know what he did. Uh, what him and his mom did against um, Isaac or Esau. But this should definitely put some fear into people because it just goes to show how God is sovereign over everybody's heart. I'm sure Laban didn't even think twice. He didn't even think anything of it when he deceived him. God just put it in his heart to go ahead and give Leah away first, you know. But I'm sure that um, Jacob knew between him and the Lord that it was that was his recompense. And I'm sure God put that in his conscience that this is why I did this, because you did this all them years ago. But Laban is just ignorant. He didn't really know what he was doing. God just used him. So um, that should be a lesson for you, for y'all out there, because I know I have enemies watching my channel as well, um, along with the body of Christ. For the body of Christ, just know, and I'm not even done yet. Like I said, it gets much worse. <laughs> Trust me. I just love this story. Just know that if somebody is mistreating you or they're persecuting you in the faith, honey, go ahead and give that to God because you're going to see from this story the way that God deals with people and the way he judges them for treating you that way, it sucks and it hurts. And it just, it just goes to show how you cannot even be in fellowship or contact with that person, but God is going to see to it that they reap exactly what they sell for what they did to you. And for those of you who are the enemies out there, and you like treating people like crap and being nasty to people and being ugly to people. You're only just storing up more wrath for yourself. I know that you're deceived and the enemy has you deceived to believe that you can treat people like that. And you're not going to suffer anything for it. But God has a way of giving you a very, very bitter harvest. And he knows how to hit where it hurts. So I would advise you to humble yourself and to repent. Go apologize to them people, whoever they are. And you just uh <laughs> make, make, make sure. I want to say karma. Karma is, um, that's Hindu, but... You get your stuff right so your harvest can just be a little bit okay because you can't change what you already did. But I would just advise you to stop being salty, stop being ugly to people, and do unto others as you would have them do unto you because your harvest is going to suck. It's just going to suck hard. So, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> so, yes. So, he says, go ahead and fulfill... Um. <coughs> Fulfill your week, and then I'll give Rachel to you as well. Okay, so it says, And Laban gave to Rachel his daughter, Bilhah his handmaid, to her maid, and he went in also unto Rachel, and he loved also Rachel more than Leah. So once again, um, I kind of feel sorry for Jacob, because once again, like you can just see his mom's like characteristics, just they're deeply rooted in this guy. She was deceptive, so as a result, he was deceptive and manipulative and all this other stuff. So now you see um, his mom was showing favoritism towards him over Esau. So now I honestly feel like, you know, that's probably why Jacob showed favoritism with Rachel over Leah, even though Leah was the first wife. So clearly, he's still not honoring the first, <laughs> like the spiritual law of just, you know, Serving the first person first. So he probably still just has to change in that aspect. Um, I don't even know what it was about Rachel that just made him fall head over heels for her like that. It doesn't say in the scripture besides that she was beautiful. So for all we know, it could have been lust. I really don't know. But um, so he's showing favoritism pretty much. Hasn't changed. And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, 
he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. <laughs> so the Lord sees that, um, man, this, this is just a season where, man, Jacob is just really, really reaping that bitter harvest that he sowed. He sees that he's still, he's not, he's still not changing his heart. He's showing favoritism towards one wife over the other, the second wife at that over the first one. And God sees that, you know, even though, like I said, God um, made all these promises to Jacob. He is going to use Jacob to continue the lineage and they are going to come through Rachel. But God still does not like stuff like that. Stuff like that is very hurtful. So he's going to be looking out for both parties. And um, even though the scripture, it just goes to show how God does love everyone, even though we're all kind of like under different categories. The Bible does say that God loved Jacob and hated Esau, but you still see that Jacob still reaped what he sowed for doing what he did to Esau. So God is a righteous judge either way. You can't say just because I'm God's child and I'm favored and I'm chosen, I'm just going to get away with anything. You're not going to get away with nothing. Period. So the Lord sees that he's showing favoritism towards one wife and not the other. So what he does is he makes it to where his favorite wife can't have no kids for him, but Leah can. <laughs> And Leah conceived and bare a son, and she called his name Reuben, for she said, Surely the Lord has looked upon my affliction. Now, therefore, my husband will love me. Every time I read this about Leah and Rachel, it honestly just breaks my heart. I'm not going to lie. I'm team Rachel all the way. But at the same time, I relate to Leah because I just feel sorry for the girl. It's like she didn't ask. Number one, she did not ask to even be married to him. So for all you know, she probably had no real interest in Jacob. I mean, because if you go read, you know, the previous chapter, Rachel was the one that Jacob asked for and Rachel was the one that um he wanted to marry and that Laban was going to give over to him. So Leah was not even in the picture and Laban didn't even mention that the first, the first uh, sister, the older sister has to be married over before the second in their country. And Jacob was not made aware of that. So it's kind of like Leah was thrown into the marriage. She probably didn't even want Jacob. And um, it was just really unfair on her part. So now Leah's in a situation to where, because of the law, and she has to like honor her father, she's married to this guy who doesn't even want her, doesn't love her. And it clearly shows by how he wants her sister over her. There's nothing more humiliating than your husband or a guy that you're entitled to spiritually and legally wanting your sister over you i mean like can you imagine what they did to this woman's self-esteem being older than her sister being forced into a marriage she did probably didn't want any any part of it all and on top of that now that she does have rights to the guy so you I mean you could say well since he's my husband now then i may as well just be a wife to him but he still don't even want her like he's still choosing her sister over her so um and um, the Bible doesn't give details, but I mean, you can pretty much put two and two together. If the Lord is going to close Rachel's womb and open Leah's, it shows that it, it hurt her that much that she was probably crying out to God about that all the time. It really, really hurt her feelings that she's married to this guy and he just wants nothing to do with her. I wouldn't be surprised if he just married her for like sport or because he had to and literally probably never had sex with her. Never spent time with her. Like all the attention and time was going to... Rachel, you may as well say it's almost like she didn't really exist. <laughs> so, um, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I know, but like, I don't know, maybe y'all could relate to Lee a little bit better. Maybe y'all know what that feels like to just be ignored like that. But, um, just, just reading this, I can just feel Leah's pain because this is something that she was persistent in when she was in prayer to God. Like this really was hurting and breaking this woman's heart. Like my husband does not love me. And you see, when she has the first kid, it's like God finally honors her. You know, God's heart is just going out to her and he, he can feel everything that she feels. And I'm sure that the Lord's heart was breaking for her as well, because that's not a good feeling. Nobody likes to be rejected, you know. And like I said, I'm sure that spirit of rejection came upon Leah strong. She already it already says that, you know, she was tender eyes. So she probably wasn't even as pretty as her sister. That makes it worse. So low self-esteem, inferiority, insecurity, rejection, all them demonic spirits, honey, just tormenting that poor woman. And um, when she has the first baby, she says, now, therefore, my husband will love me. So in her mind, she's thinking, well, maybe he'll love me now that I, I gave him a kid. Like, that's that's really heartbreaking just to read that. <sighs> and uh, she conceived again and bare a son. 
and said, because the Lord has heard, I was hated for saying. He has therefore given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. And she conceived again and bare a son and said, now this time will my husband be joined unto me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore was his name called Levi. <clears throat> And she conceived again and bare a son, and she said, Now will I praise the Lord. Therefore, she called his name Judah and left bearing. So she is just having like multiple kids by her husband, which it is a blessing from the Lord, definitely. But I think at some point she realized, like, I'm popping out all these babies, all these babies for this man, and he still does not love me. And it's, it's just very hurtful. I mean, you can clearly see this is something she. Like I said, she's persistent with, she's crying out to God about, because every kid she has, she keeps saying, now my husband's going to love me. Second kid, well, now God sees how much my husband hates me. So now maybe now I have two kids by him. Maybe he'll show me some type of affection. He's still not doing it. Third kid, okay, well, maybe now he'll love me. I have three kids by him now. Maybe he'll, you know, so at, by the fourth kid, by that time, she probably was just like, you know what, screw him. <laughs> like, now I'm going to praise the Lord. And I, I see now I can't get my joy and my contentment from my husband, unfortunately. So, yeah. 